Hey everyone, on behalf of Edrica, I'm going to be bringing you a full stack application tutorial. Now, many of you may be familiar with what's called the mean stack, which is MongoDB, AngularJS, Express, and Node.js. We're going to be doing a couple twists on this very popular stack and introducing GraphQL, which is a technology from Facebook that makes it easy to query fields and send data between the server and client. And we're also going to be replacing Angular with React. And this is called the MERN stack. So what exactly is the MERN stack? Well, it's the same thing as the mean stack, but replacing Angular with React. So here is what it looks like. We're going to be using React.js on the front end for the web application. In the middle is going to sit our server, which is going to take requests from their web app. And this is going to be running Node.js with Express. And then we're also going to communicate between the web app and the server using GraphQL. And then in the very back is our database. We're going to store all the data, and we're going to be using MongoDB for this. You guys may be wondering, why might you want to use React.js over something like Angular or just JavaScript itself? Well, this is a very popular framework right now. It is currently what Facebook uses on their very own website. And it's very nice to build applications with. It has somewhat of a steeper learning curve, I would say, than some of the other frameworks. But once you learn it, you can be very productive and build very high quality production ready web applications, which is very cool. And then GraphQL is gonna help us optimize and send really good queries. That's another thing that is used by Facebook and is a Facebook technology. And then MongoDB is just a really solid database for NoSQL. So that means it's very easy to store different types of data. And as our database changes and our application changes, it's very easy to change our schema or what our data looks like in the database. And then Express is very nice to make a server with very fast. So that's our choice here. So there's really four main operations when building an application like this and they're known as CRUD. So what CRUD stands for is Create, Read, Update, and Delete. So we're gonna be using MongoDB and Mongoose. Mongoose is a library to basically do operations on the MongoDB database in Node.js. And to create, we're going to basically add something to our database, and we're gonna be using the save command. Then there's reading, which is viewing objects or viewing data from our database, which is a find command. And then update, which is changing some values in the database, using update again. And then finally, delete, removing data from our database. And this is going to be remove. So the application that we're going to be building to uh, try this stack out, the MERN stack, is a to-do list app. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So there are a few prerequisites for this tutorial. First off, make sure you have a editor of some sort. I'm gonna be using Visual Studio Code where I can edit files. And then you wanna make sure you have a terminal. I'm gonna be using the terminal built into Visual Studio Code and we're just gonna be doing some things with that. So make sure you have both of those. And then we're gonna be using MongoDB. So you're gonna to wanna to install that. And the recommended way to install MongoDB, I'm using a Mac. I would recommend something called Homebrew. Homebrew is a package manager. It makes it really fast, really nice to install dependencies. If you just copy this URL right here, you can paste that into Terminal and run it. I already have it, so I'm not going to do that right now. But then you have Homebrew. And then with Homebrew, I can brew install MongoDB. And that'll just install MongoDB on my computer. And then to verify that you have MongoDB, you can just type Mongo. And you can see here's the version of my Mongo shell, and then you can see whether you connect it to it. So the other thing is to make sure you do start your Mongo database. So I already had mine started, so I was able to connect to this. If you use brew, you can just do brew services. And then instead of restart, we're going to start. So brew services start MongoDB if you installed this with Homebrew. The other thing we're going to need is Node.js. So again, once you have Homebrew, you can do brew install node. So you can see it's really nice to just install things with Homebrew. It makes it super easy. And if you type node-v in terminal, you should see a value 
and here's the version. I'm currently on node 9.11. And then with that, you should get npm, which is node package manager. I'm using 5.8, so you just want to verify both of those got installed. Now, if you're not running on a Mac, you can't use Homebrew. I just recommend going to the official websites for MongoDB and Node.js and downloading them that way. All right, so we're ready to get started. We're going to be starting from a blank directory. So I have just an empty folder right here called server. If I do an ls, there's nothing in there right now. And I'm going to start off the project with npm init. And I'm just going to do dash y. This accepts all the defaults and just creates a package.json file. So we have one file now in our project. And this is going to hold basically where our configuration stuff for the project. So what dependencies we need mainly. So we're going to start off by adding a dependency called GraphQL Yoga. This is a really nice GraphQL server that makes it super easy. We're going to install it. So we're going to copy this. And I'm just going to say npm install. GraphQL yoga. And you want to make sure and run this command inside the server directory. And it's going to go ahead and install this for us. Now, here is a little quick start that we're going to use. And we're going to copy the quick start and paste it into a file. I'm going to create a new file called index.js and paste it in here. So let's go through exactly what all this stuff is doing. First line is importing the package. We're going to use the require syntax because we're just going to use node. So here we are importing GraphQL Yoga, which is that library. Here is what's known as the schema. So we're using GraphQL. So with GraphQL, you have to set up a schema. And our schema right now has this thing called a query type. And inside of query type, we have hello. And hello takes one argument. It kind of looks like a function. This argument is name. Name is the name of the argument. And then string is the data type for it. And then this is the return type which is a string as well. The exclamation mark at the end means this is a string that is mandatory. You have to pass it in. And then here are what known as the resolvers for this. So the resolvers, you'll notice the kind of the shape of it matches. So query and then hello, query then hello. And here there's argument called name. So you can see we're destructuring this second parameter, which is called just the arguments. And we're getting the name. And here we're returning a string and we're using a string template here. So we're saying hello, and then if they give us a name, we say hello, that person's name, or we do just hello world if they didn't give us a name, right? And then here we're specifying the type defs and the resolvers, and we're going to do server.start to start this server. Now we're going to get more into what the type defs and these resolvers are, but I want to go ahead and just run this um, so you can see what happens. So I'm going to say node and then index.js to start it up. And now we have a GraphQL server uh, running on localhost 4000. And we're not using Express directly, but under the hood, GraphQL Yoga uses Express. So all right, let's go to localhost 4000 and see what's going on there. So we'll get this thing that says loading GraphQL Playground. I've been here before, so I have some junk. Just going to clear that off. And so. If I click on schema, I can see on the right what things I can run or what things I can do here. This is a GraphQL playground. And what this is, is you can run your queries. And queries are read. So we talked about CRUD operations before. Queries are for reading things or finding or viewing the data you have stored. So us, we want to query this hello thing. So how would we do that? Well, we would do curly braces like that, and then we say hello. And I can either pass an argument or I don't have to pass an argument. So we can prettify this. So if I don't pass an argument and I hit run, I get data, hello, and then hello world. So by default, the argument would be null or undefined getting passed in. And then we saw that that would go to uh, world. But here I can specify an argument if I want to. And I could say Ben, so hello Ben. And we run that and we can see it changes. So you can notice this argument we can change and we get different results out of it. I can just do a random string if I want and I get that back. So with GraphQL, we can pass different things in and get different results back, kind of like a function call. And uh, we're just getting a string back. And you'll notice the shape is very similar to the shape over here, which is nice. That's how GraphQL works. 
So we have this outer data, and then after that it matches. So hello is the name of the query, so that's why those two match up. And then here's the string that that equals. And we're going to get more complicated as we add to-dos and whatnot. All right, so this is the basics of how the GraphQL is working. There's those other things which are called mutations. So there's two main things in GraphQL, queries and mutations. Queries are for looking at the data, which I already said, and that's what we ran right here. We could prefix this with the word query to be more explicit. Those are doing the same things. The other thing is called mutations. These are when we add data, we update data, or we delete data. We're going to be running mutations. And we'll get into those very shortly when we add our MongoDB connection. So our server is good. We're going to move on to connecting to MongoDB. And to do this, we're going to be using something called Mongoose. So first off, we need to install this. So I'm going to come over here to Terminal, stop my server, do npm install Mongoose. So Mongoose is going to allow us to connect to our MongoDB database and then run queries, create data, or whatnot. And we're just going to follow the getting started. So here is how we make a connection. So I'm just going to add this at the very top. And I'm going to change this to const. So I am first grabbing this from the package or importing it. So here I have the mongoose object and I'm first connecting to the database. So I'm at localhost and I'm going to connect to the test and I'm just going to call this test5 because I don't know if I already have a test database or not and I'd like to connect to a fresh database. So this is the name of your database at the very end here. And then after that we, we want to do is first connect to the database and then start the server. So it doesn't immediately connect when we run this. It actually runs in the background. And we can use a callback, so db.once, and wait for it to open or get connected. Now we don't, they, to get this db variable, they did mongoose connection. And then inside of that, they're going to pass the server.start. So once we connect to the mongodb database, we then start our GraphQL server. All right, so next thing we want to do is create a schema, which is then going to be our basically our database model or what we're going to store in the database. So we're going to grab this mongoose model and we're going to change it up a little bit. So they are doing a kitten. For us, we are going to do a to do. So the model is going to be to do and we're going to have a few things. So the first is text and here we pass we pound a pass the data type. So the text is going to be a string. So we say string and then we want to have a complete, which is going to be not a string but a boolean. Okay, so we have two fields, text and complete on this to do object. So we can save this in our database if we want to and uh, we can pass two fields in the text and whether the to do is complete or not. So I'm first going to add a type called mutation and I'm going to say create to do and I'm going to have two arguments I want to get passed in the text and that's actually it by default I want to say complete is false because when you first created to do it is not complete so text here is going to be a string and I'm going to say you have to pass in a parameter and to force them to pass in an argument you do the, the bang sign there and then what we're going to do is return a to-do. Instead of just like a string or a boolean, we're going to return a type called to-do. So I can create this type, to-do, and it's going to have text, which is a string, which is required, and complete, which is a boolean, which are required. So two required fields, text and complete. And in our mutation, we're going to create a to-do. And assuming you gave us a good text, we'll pass you back a to-do. Um, the other field this is going to have, and this is a field that Mongo adds by default, which is an ID. And there's a special type for this in GraphQL called ID. So that's required as well. So we don't have to pass the ID here. It's going to be automatically generated for us. So now we can try creating this to do. So I'm going to say mutation and create to do. And we don't care about the first argument to this GraphQL function. So these are called resolver functions right here. The first thing they are passed are the parent, which you don't have to worry about for this. The second argument 
is the argument. So for this, we expect an argument called text. So I'm gonna say text here. And from this, what we're gonna do, and I'm gonna make this an async function. We're going to first create a to-do. So I'm gonna say const to-do is equal to new to-do. And here I pass in the text and complete. So pass in text and complete. And by default, I'm gonna say complete is false, that uh, the to-do is not complete. And then we're gonna return the to-do. But before we return it, we have to save it to the database with dot save. And dot save returns a promise. So we wanna await that. And we will await this to-do from being saved into the database. So we're creating an instance of it, saving it to the database, and then returning it. So I can start my server, and we can see if this code works. And if it does, what we should do is be able to create a to-do in our database. So we're gonna say node index.js. All right, so it started up, so it looks like it was able to connect to the MongoDB instance okay. And bring the playground over here. And I'm gonna say mutation. So for queries, we could say the word query there or leave it off. For mutations, we have to say the word mutation here. And then I'm gonna say create. And we can see it in our schema over here, whether it's there or not, and it's not. That usually just means you have to refresh whenever we restart the server. So now under mutations, we can see the create to do. And this is kind of like our own documentation that was automatically generated for us. So that's really cool and a nice feature of GraphQL. So create to do, we now have text. So create to do, text, and I'm gonna say my first item. Now you can see it's kind of mad at us, but this is the exact same thing that we did with the hello, right? Well, it expects a little bit different return type to do, which is an object. So we have to actually specify which fields that we want back. So there's text, there's ID, and there's complete, right? So if I specify all three here, I'm gonna get all three fields back. So when I run this, we can see, hey, look, our item was created, we can see an ID, and it's false. I can run this again, you'll notice we should get a different ID there. Looks like the B's incrementing at the end. And here you'll see what the power of GraphQL is. If I only want a single field back, so maybe I only care about the ID, I only have to select the ID here, and I'll only get the ID back here. So I only get one field back. Or maybe I only care about the name, or not the name, text. So you don't get extra fields back, which is really nice with GraphQL. You just get exactly the data that you want. But all right, cool. We just added a bunch of to-do items to our database. Let's go ahead and fetch them, or read them, or query them. So to do this, we're gonna add a query. We first update the schema and then you add the implementation of how the data is getting fetched. So here I want to get all the to-dos, so I'm gonna call it to-dos, and it just returns an array of to-dos. Now to return an array, you do brackets like that, so to-do. So this means we return an array of to-do, of the type to-do. So then in my query over here, I'm gonna say to-dos, and I don't really care about any arguments because I'm just returning all of them. I'm just gonna say to-do.find. And this will find all of the to-dos and it'll return them and then we can see them all. So that's all we need to do. So I'm gonna control C, restart the server. And now we can head back over to our application and refresh. We should now have a new query and we can see it right here called to-dos and we should be able to see all the different to-dos that we created earlier. So I'm gonna say to-dos, and I don't need to pass in any arguments, but I do need to select which attributes that I wanna get back. So ID, text, and then complete. So if I run this, I can see all the different items that we created earlier. I give them all the same name though, so that's why it looks like this. If we want to, we could create a new one. So mutation create to do and I could give it a different text like item 2 for example and maybe I only want to see the ID back and now if I query that again you can see at the very bottom our new item item 2 so perfect and again we don't have to query all the fields for example I could just do ID and text and then complete would be removed from all these items just like that all right so that's perfect, we now have two of the CRUD operations done.
creating to-do items, reading to-do items with this query right here. The next thing we wanna do is updating an item. So the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna create a new mutation called update to-do. This will have two arguments, the ID, and this is what we'll use to know what to do to update, and then also complete. And this is gonna be a Boolean. We could also specify the text, but we don't really need to update the text, at least in this application, just whether this to-do has been complete or not. And then we're gonna return a Boolean, and this is going to be true or false, whether we are able to update the to-do. So now we're gonna add the implementation for this, update to-do and async, and this is going to have those two arguments, id and complete, and here we're going to do to do dot find by id and update. And here we're going to specify the id as the first argument. And the second, we specify what changed. So the thing that changed is complete. And we're going to pass that in. And this is the new value for what complete is. And this returns back, I believe, I guess a document query is looks like what it comes back. I was thinking this might be a promise as well that we might have to await it. We'll see if this works. I think it should. And then lastly, if that works, we just return true. So if this doesn't work, we'll get an error or something and that'll be thrown back and that's fine. So let's go back over and see this in action. And I we need to make sure to restart the server. So anytime throughout this, if uh, you don't see something looking right when you head over here, just remember to refresh and also restart your server. So we see in our mutations now an update to do. You can see the two arguments right here and we expect Boolean back. So why don't we change this one right here? So I'm gonna copy that ID and I'm gonna say mutation and I'm gonna say update to do. The ID is going to be that string that I copied and complete is going to be true. And we can run that and we get true back, meaning it worked. And now I can query all the to-dos. So we can go back and I can grab it and we need to grab complete. And this first value is now true. So perfect, so update works. So now we can update any item in our database based on the ID that we are given. The last thing we wanna do is delete it. So pretty much the same way we did update to do. We're gonna do remove to do. And here we don't need to know whether it needs to be complete or not. So we can just remove that part and have only one argument, which ID that we need to remove. Um, and then a Boolean true or false, whether the operation was successful. So we can copy this. I'm going to do remove to do. We can get rid of that argument. And then here we're gonna say, find by ID, but now it's gonna be removed. And now we don't need this second argument. We just need to pass in the ID. So I'm gonna restart the server and we're gonna try this one last time. This is the last operation that we need. And let's say I wanna delete this item right here that is, so we see I removed to do there, perfect. And the other thing is you can create tabs. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop a tab open here. That way we can do this in a separate tab and not have to redo this. So remove to do, ID, pass that ID in. We get true, which means it should be gone. So now when I rerun this query here, we should not see this first one right there. And sure enough, it is gone, so delete also works. So that's perfect. We have all our CRUD operations that we wanna do and we're done with our server. Now really what we wanna do is create a client or a web app using React that allows us to do these. So we can view our to-dos, we can click on it to cross it out, we can add to-dos, or we can just straight up delete them if we no longer need them. So let's get into doing that. So I'm going to keep this server running and open up a new tab. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a different folder and I want to create a folder for my React application. Now we're gonna be using something called Create React App. So this is a CLI tool and you can download it using NPM. So NPM install dash G create React App. If you go ahead and run that, that'll download it for you. And then what you can do is do create React App and then the name that you want. So I'm gonna call mine Client.
Now I've already run this, and when you run this, you're gonna get a folder, and I can just do ls right here, a folder called client or whatever you named it, and it's gonna download, and this, this operation also takes a little bit of time because it's gonna download all the dependencies and whatnot. This is a boilerplate for creating a React applications that just gets you set up really nicely. So I have it open right here, and we can check out what's going on here. We can look at package.json. We have dependencies react, and we can see we have some couple scripts that we're going to be using. So just right off the bat, if we wanted to, I could cd into my folder and run npm start. And what that will do is it'll run the scripts start command, which runs this thing right here. And what that does is it starts my server. And this is a different server. So this is a development server. And this is just gonna be allow you to see your React application as you develop it. So here's the basically the hello world. And we can go in and change it. So if you go to source, you should see app.js and you should see some stuff. So instead of welcome to React, we could say welcome to GraphQL. Save this, and what's gonna happen is it's gonna refresh and we see in our browser, welcome to GraphQL. So it's kind of cool. So as we do this, it's gonna just automatically refresh as we're typing. So we're ready to start adding some stuff to our application now. I guess I should go over the structure real quick. So the important parts are the source. This is where all our JavaScript code is going and where all the React. There's a folder called public, which you can see has a HTML in it. And this HTML file is what our JavaScript or React application runs in or it gets run applied to, if you will. So here we can see this div root. This is where our entire React application is going to be put. So in index.js, when I say react-dom.render-app, our application is being rendered in the element, which is root, which we just saw. And if we look at what app.js is, we can see this is what's getting rendered. So when I changed welcome to GraphQL, that's why we saw a change over there. And you can see this is just kind of similar to HTML. This is called JSX. And this allows you to mix pretty much JavaScript with uh, HTML. And we'll see more of this when we actually do some more coding with this. But we can go ahead and delete some of these extra files because we don't need them. First off, app.test, we don't need. We don't need app.css. We don't need index.css. And we don't need logo.svg. So those are just some extra files we don't need. We can clear out all this code right here and simplify it a little bit. We can just say div hello and get rid of these things at the top. The things at the top are just import statements using a fancier JavaScript syntax. And we just need to import React. And index.js, we can just remove the index.css. So if we come back over here, it should now be blank, just hello, and we can start adding our code. So what we want to do is to run the same queries and whatnot that we ran in GraphQL Playground. So for example, I would like to render these to-dos in my React application. And to do that, I want to run this query. And to run GraphQL queries from React into server, we're going to be using something called Apollo. So Apollo GraphQL allows us to do this. It's very easy to get started. We're going to be downloading a few things here to help us out. So Apollo Boost, which is an, a library they created, React Apollo, GraphQL Tag, and GraphQL. Here's some little descriptions about what each one does, but basically GraphQL and GraphQL tag are for parsing the query. So basically what we write here parses this into an object that basically they can understand. And then React Apollo is the bindings to React. It gives you some React components and we'll see that. And then Apollo Boost is for actually just setting up and making the queries. So we're gonna copy this NPM statement and I'm gonna control C the server that started and add this in. And the first thing that we need to do is create what's called a Apollo client. So I'm gonna copy this and we're gonna add that to our index. Actually, we can add it to our, yeah, index.js is fine. We could add it to either place. But the reason why I wanna do it here is because we also need to get a Apollo provider from React Apollo and pass in our client. So Apollo provider, and this is just gonna wrap our whole application. And we need to pass in our client. So our client is this thing right here that we create. And basically the only thing we're specifying here is the URL to our server. So our server is not running at this location. It's running at HTTP 
slash local host 4000. So it knows where to make requests. So it's now gonna send GraphQL requests all to the server, which is perfect. That's where our server is running. And we need to be able to access this client throughout our whole React application. And the way we do that is by using React Apollo's Apollo provider. So this wraps our entire app. And now we have access to this client and we can make requests throughout our app and we'll see that. So let's make sure adding that didn't break anything. So I'm gonna do npm start and we should still see just the word hello and nothing different because this doesn't actually do anything yet. We didn't tell it what to query. All we said was this is where we want you to make queries. I added this client equal new Apollo client before these import statements. You need to make sure that comes afterwards. So just like that. And cool. So it refreshes and hello is there. Nice. Now we can start doing some stuff. So in app.js, why don't we run a query? And the query that I wanna run is that same one we have here in our playground. So what I usually like to do is run it here and then just copy it. So const, and we'll say this to do's query and paste it in. So this is just a string of the query. Now we added a library to help us parse this called GraphQL tag. So we're gonna import GQL from GraphQL tag. And this is actually gonna parse this query right here. And the way we do that is GQL right there. Now you may be thinking I might have mistyped this and I meant to do something like this in the pass in the function, and that is not the case. You actually call it just like this, where GQL is right up against it. This is a string template calling, and it will pass to this function okay, and it will parse this out. Next thing is we need to basically bind it with our component. And the way we do that is with a higher order component. So import GraphQL from React Apollo. And this is coming from the React Apollo package. So we say GraphQL, we specify what query we want or what mutation we want. In this case, I want the to-dos query. And we wrap our app. And now injected into the app's props are some stuff. So now when I say this.props, I have a few things. I have data and loading. So loading, and why don't we actually, I'm just going to console.log this so we can take a look at what actually the values are. And if we come over here, if you just right click and inspect, you can see in the console what these are. So, and let's do a before and after. So this is export default app. So before we actually call this higher order component GraphQL, you'll notice here are the props, just an empty object. But now when we add this thing back, we have some stuff in our props that are going to help us out. So first you'll notice we have dot data and inside of data there is loading. So loading is true and there's basically nothing else. There's a bunch of functions we can call, but those don't look helpful, right? Um, those are for other things, which is more complex. But once it's done loading, it'll say loading false, and it should get some to-dos. And we can see this to-dos here. And we can actually see, wow, look, this looks like the data that we had over here, right? Well, it's exactly that. So what we can do in our code now is we can say const data, and we can get loading and to-dos. So this is just destructuring it from the props. I'm getting the loading that we saw in the to-dos. And I'm saying, if it's loading, just return null. And if it's not, what I want to do is just to-dos.map. And for each to-do, I want to just render it. So I'm going to render a div, and I'm just going to display the to-do.text. And we can come back over here. It's going to load for a second, and then we're going to see all our items. Now, we need to add a key, and the reason for this is we need to have every single one be unique, and this helps for loading purposes with uh, React. It'll load faster and have less conflicts in your list. So I'm gonna say, pass in the to-do.id to make this unique, and I'm gonna say to-do item. So this is a unique string that identifies each to-do, and then that error goes away. But we can see our items right here, and now if I want to, I can change one of these items so for example, I could remove a to-do. So we have one to-do down here called item two. I could remove him. And if we refresh, it now fetches it and it's gone. So pretty cool. So those are connected to the same database, same server, all that stuff. All right.
So this is a little teaser, a little intro into Apollo and how we're gonna do our queries. But now what I wanna do is add some material UI to make this look pretty. And then we're gonna continue on with some more mutations and whatnot. So we're gonna be adding this package. This is material UI from Google and it just makes everything look really nice and it's a nice utility. So we're gonna install, go through the installation. So we need to install the core of it. Again, just gonna control C and add that. And then we need to add some things to our header, some links. So to import the Roboto font. And that's when we just go to the public index.html uh, and we can put that right here. And the reason this uh, material UI needs this font, so we're just importing the font so it has access to it. And then the other thing is we also want to add some SVG icons. So I'm gonna go ahead and install that package as well. All right. And the first thing that I wanna do is render some paper. Uh, and the reason why I wanna render some paper, this is a component from Material UI, is so I can put a list on that paper. So we're gonna come back over here and the nice thing about Material UI is they have great demos, so I can actually just take this and grab what I want from it. So we're gonna import paper. So to do that, we have to import paper from at Material UI core paper, and then we can actually render this. So I'm gonna have an outer div, and I wanna center this guy. And the way I'm gonna center this is by creating two divs. And you can actually add styling to these using the style prop. And this is kind of like CSS, but it's all camel cased. I'm gonna say display flex. And then the style here, I'm gonna say margin auto. And I'm also gonna give it a width of 400. So now I've created this basically inner div and I'm gonna render my paper here. And then I'm gonna give it an elevation and let's give it an elevation of one. So let's see that paper in action that we just added. And once we get this paper the way we like it, we're gonna then turn the list that we have here into an actual material UI list that looks like this and looks more like to-do items or check items. All right, so I reran the server and we can see it's nicely centered and it's on some paper, perfect. Let's go ahead and now add a list. So this is the list that I want to add and we're going to just copy this. And I'm actually just gonna copy this entire example here. And we're gonna take the bits and pieces that I want from that. So let's grab that and we're gonna paste it in. I'm just gonna paste it in below. First thing that I wanna do is remove some of these things that I don't care about. So the first three imports we don't need, but I do need list, all this list associated things, and I do want the icons. So I'm gonna copy those and just move them to the top where my other imports are. And then I basically just wanna merge these two. I, I don't care about the style, we're gonna add our own style. Um, so when, where he was adding styles here, I just wanna move their outer div and I'm gonna replace it with my stuff. So this is what we added, and I wanna just add the stuff in there. I guess the best way is we're gonna copy these two, and we're just gonna go through what this code does in just one second. I first wanna make sure it renders okay. So we're gonna add these two. State is kind of interesting, and this is just another function. We'll talk about state in a second. We don't care about the props. This is our list. And we don't care about these things either. Okay. So we're gonna take our list and plop it down here. And they're going over their mapping and they're doing this thing, right? So that's the exact same thing we did here. So we wanna just replace that map with to-dos. And instead of value, this is going to be to-do. And here's our key. I'm just gonna call it to do.id. Um, we could just pass the ID or we could do it like this. Since our application's not too big, I'm just gonna pass in the ID. 
Now anywhere we see a value, we're going to have to change this stuff. I'm not going to worry about the class name stuff. I'm going to remove that. So handle toggle, we're going to pass in our to-do item. And then here, we're going to pass in to-do. I guess this is a separate thing checked. I'm going to say to-do.complete. So if the to-do is complete, I would like the checkbox to be checked. Value, I want this to be line item. I think that's what they're rendering. We can come back over here. Yep, line item one. So this is the text that's getting rendered. The text that I would like to get rendered is to do dot text. And we can get rid of that. All right, let's go ahead and see if this actually shows up okay. And then we're going to walk through the code. All right, so this looks pretty good. And I can see my items. And nothing happens when I clicked, but we're going to go over how we can get stuff to happen. Okay, so let's go over the code. So starting at the top, we have this thing called state. So this is where we store information about our application that could change. So for example, they are keeping something called checked, and this changes. So depending on what is checked in the application, they are keeping track of here. Now we don't really need state, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of it because we're storing everything in the MongoDB, is our state, if you will. And we're fetching everything with GraphQL. This handle toggle thing, this I believe is, okay, yes. So when we click on a list item, for us, what we want to do is actually just mark it off, right? When I click on this, it should be, whoops, we crashed it because we're not supposed to click on things. But when I click on this, we should complete it and we don't need it anymore, right? It should check off or whatnot. So here I'm gonna just add a to-do basically. We're gonna remove all the stuff here. It's gonna be update to-do. And it's just gonna to toggle whether it's complete or not. And this is gonna be a to-do. Okay, so next bit, we can just go down the code right here. So we have a list item. I don't know why they have a role of undefined. This stuff is probably uh, specific to Material UI and how the styling looks. Uh, t checkbox, disable ripple. I guess that's when you check. So these are some CSS things that you can take on and off depending on what you want to look. Checked, this is a value of whether or not the checkboxes are checked. So for example, if I say true, all the checkboxes are going to be checked here. They were all false because all of them to do dot complete are false. But if I were to say update one of them, so let's say the first one, and you just remove this update to do ID complete is true. All right, so it's now been updated in the database. If I refresh, you can now see the checkbox checks there. So all we need to do is update our database and this stuff changes. We can see our primary, this text is just gonna take whatever the text is for the to-do. And then this second part here is just this whole right side. This is how we get this thing on the right. Now for us, we don't really like this comment icon. Really what we want is instead of a comment, like an X to delete it, right? Um, and I'm just gonna remove, I guess, yeah, I'm gonna remove this aria label, we don't need it. So let's go ahead and do that, replace this icon with a, a new one. So we did all of these, and what we want next is to pick out an icon. So here is the website for Material UI that you can actually search and find all the icons that are available and which one you wanna pick. This is the one I wanna do, this close right here, which is an X, and it's under navigation. So to add this, we're gonna scroll up to the top, and instead of a comment icon, I'm gonna say close icon, and I'm just gonna replace comment with close, and we'll see if that works. Close icon, refresh, and sure enough, the icon shows up as an X, perfect. So now I just wanna hook this up. So this icon button should have an on click, and we're just going to pass in. And here what we're going to do is delete this to do, right? So we can create one. So this is called handle toggle. I'm gonna call this, and 
I want to just do this in a slightly different way. I'm just going to create the lambda like this so it's a little bit simpler. All right. So I'm going to call this function update to do. And this is a function that is going to update the to do. And I also want to do remove to do, which takes a to do, and we're going to remove to do. So th those are our two things we need to do. So here I made a little lambda that's going to call um, this dot remove to do, passing in our to do. So it should remove it whenever that gets clicked. And then whenever we click this, we're going to call this dot update to do. And the reason why we want to do the functions like this, uh, you may have seen stuff like this. And we want to access something called this. And we can actually not access this in functions like that unless we do an extra thing called binding. But this automatically binds, so that's the reason why I like using a function like this. In general, I would just recommend writing your functions like this if you add functions. All right, so let's get into the logic of how update and remove work. So I guess let's do update first. So to actually update, if we come to our playground, we have the code right here. So I'm gonna copy this, and I'm gonna say const update mutation. So what I wanna do is pass in a variable ID in a variable complete or not. And the way you do this with GraphQL is I'm gonna say dollar sign ID and dollar sign complete. So these are variables and I have to specify my variables up here. So I'm gonna have an ID and specify the type. The ID is gonna be an ID and complete. This variable is going to be a Boolean. Both of these are mandatory and you need to make sure the types here match the types in your schema. So if we come here, we expect an ID required and a Boolean required. So I need to put those here as well. So now I need to inject my app with this mutation. Now I could do this in a very ugly way by doing this. And then I could wrap that entire application like so. Mutation, oops, not mutation event, but our update mutation. But you can see this will slowly grow and get super ugly. There's a function that React Apollo gives us called compose that's going to help us out. So I just deleted the whole application on accident. There we go. Welcome back. So compose, what we're going to do is have GraphQL like that. So now we pass GraphQL, all our GraphQLs, or all our higher order functions, to the compose function which basically squishes them together, and then we wrap our app. This is just a little bit nicer way to write it. They're equivalent to JavaScript, though. All right, so now what we can do is we've added a new thing to our props. And we can give it a name. I'm going to call it update to do. So now in my update to do function, I can say this.props.update to do. And this function is available in my props because I specified it here and the name I specified matches. All right, so what I need to do to pass to this is those variables. And this is a asynchronous function, so I'm going to await it. And the variables that I need to pass in are an ID and complete. So the ID, I'm gonna say to do.id, and then complete, I'm gonna do the opposite. So to do dot complete. So I'm going to do the opposite of the current value of complete. So if it is complete right now, I uncomplete it. If it hasn't been completed, I now complete it. So yep, my server started. If I come over here and I click on this, it'll look like it's not working, right? I clicked on every single one of these, nothing happened, right? You may be, oh, an error occurred or something, right? It actually worked. If we refresh, we'll see all the items are there. And if I click those two, refresh, I see those items changed. So why didn't it update right away, right? Why did we have to refresh the page for this to happen? Well, Apollo caches all your stuff by default. 
which is really nice because it saves you requests and basically optimizes things, but it doesn't refetch the data whenever we update it. So what we need to do is we need to tell Apollo to update. So there is something called update that we can pass our mutation or our function um, that looks like this. And this allows us to update the cache. So let's copy this in. And how this works is the store is where the cache, so you can think of this as the Apollo cache. And then right here, this is us getting the data. And then this is the name of our mutation. So the name of this mutation is update to do. And this name should match what we have right here, which it does. So this data is what I get back from uh, the to do, update to do. So this should be true or false a boolean of whether or not it worked. So we actually don't even need this if we don't want to, because we don't need the response to update the cache. We could just do that. So first thing we do is read the data from the cache. And the thing that we need to update is this to-dos query. So I'm going to say to-dos query. So we now have read this into the cache. And if we look down here what we were doing, we were saying data.todos. So here I want to do data.todos. And what I want to do is update one of the items. So I want to look through the todos and update the one that has an ID that matches and change whether it's complete or not. So to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say data.todos.map. And I'm going to search for the correct to do. And I'm going to say if x.id matches to do.id, then I want to create a new to do or update the completion value of to do. Otherwise, I just want to turn x. So basically, what this mapping is doing is it's looping all, through all the to dos until it finds the one we needed to update. And what we want to do is keep all the same values that to do has. So this variable is coming from up here that to do has but change complete equal to to do dot complete so just updating the value of to do so we're saying data dot to do's so we're updating what this value is looping through we're changing this one so it now is equal to the opposite of complete um, and then we're just writing it back to the store and then we just have to say our query here is to do's query and our data that we're writing back is right here. So now if we come back here, when I click on this item, it actually updates the cache, which then propagates and renders. So I now get real time updating of my items. And these are actually persisting too, right? If I refresh, they're still there. So it actually is in fact updating the database too. So nice. So I want to do the same thing with deleting items. So we're going to come back up here and do delete mutation. And we have basically the code for that too. So remove to do, and we just pass it an ID. So we can copy that. Const remove mutation. Pass that in. And here we want to pass in a variable called ID, similar to what we did with update. And it's going to be an ID. And we're just going to call that. And I want to basically pass the same, do the same function. So I'm going to copy it and paste it. So there's going to be a few differences. The name of our function is going to be different. So I'm going to scroll down here. And I'm going to say GraphQL. This is going to be remove mutation. And the name, I'm going to call it remove to do. And come back up here. I'm going to say remove to do. And variables we want to pass in, we only care about the ID. And then to update the store, instead of this mapping stuff, we want to remove an item from the list. So to remove an item from the list, we're going to filter. So we're going to look for the ID that is not equal to to do.id. So we're going to filter through the items and only remove the item where these two match up. So in other words, if the IDs don't match, we want to keep that. So we're comparing it against the one we need to remove. 
Another important thing I did not mention about this update function is you want to make sure to, when updating this, not mutate and create a new instance of it. So with filter, we create a new instance of that array. So let's see this. And oh, we need to just make this an async function, just like we did update. And let's go ahead and delete this. So when I delete it, we should see these two reds match up. And sure enough, we do. We can delete another one. And our delete function looks like it's working properly. If I refresh, we should see those items gone and nice. So there's one last thing that I want to do, and that is creating to-dos. And so we want to create just like an input field at the top where it can type stuff and uh, submit. So I'm going to create a new file called form.js. And this is going to store our form um, and keep track of the value as the person types it out. So I'm going to import React from React. Whenever you create a component in React, you always start off like this. And we're going to export default. And we export this um, like that so you can import it in our app. So I'm going to say form extends react.component. And oops, we're going to render. And what we want to render is an input field. And the input field that we want to render is the nice material UI one. So this one looks really nice. We're just going to do the basic one. Uh, we can just grab the import statement. And we can grab this just this first one. OK, so we're going to talk about on change and value in a second. I'm going to remove those three fields and the ID. The label, I'm going to call this to do dot 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 and I'm now just going to render in our app that form so first I guess we should import it so import form from dot slash form capitalization is important there and we're going to render it and we're going to render it between the paper and the list so now we should see an input field and we do hey and I want to make this a uh, full width so it extends the whole thing and I don't know, yep, so there's a property called full width. We can just pass on that. And now it should extend this whole length. Perfect. So now we can, you can see this is where the helper text is. I just call that to do, but you could call it whatever. And we want to type all that stuff in and then hit enter and then add our item, right? So we need to add some more stuff to the form. So we need to keep track of what the user's typing. And to keep track of that, we're going to use state. So I talked about earlier that we wanted to manage stuff in our state and data that changes. So this is going to be text that changes. At first, it is just an empty string. And I can get that text from this.state, and I'm going to pass that value in. So the value of the text field is equal to this text. Or whenever someone types, onChange is called. So there's an event called onChange. And when this is called, and I'm going to call this handle on change, or we can just call it handle change. And I'm going to pass in this function. Okay, so I want this function to be called whenever this one is. It's going to be passed an event. And if we do new text, it's going to be e.target.value. So e.target.value is going to be have the new text that the user just typed in. So this new text we want to now store in the state. And the way you update this state is with this.setState. And then you pass in the new value. So I'm going to say text is equal to new text. So this is us updating the state with this new text value. So whenever I'm typing, onChange will update the value in the state. And the state will propagate. And the state now is going to change the text field value. So now as we're typing this, you can see the value. And if I were to console.log this new text, we can see the value each letter that we type. So you can see each letter that I type, it kind of makes a little pyramid here, and it adds on the new text value. And then whenever the user hits enter, what I'd like to do is submit this, if you will, or create a new item here. 
Now, I'm just going to defer to whatever app.js wants to do. So I'm gonna pass a prop. I wanna call it from app.js. So to do that, what I'm gonna do is create a function called handle key down. And here I'm going to say on key down, handle key down. So now every time I press a letter, both key down and handle change are gonna get called. Now, what I wanna do is listen for when the person hits the enter key. So whenever they hit the enter key, we wanna submit the form. So to be able to know this, we have access to what key was pressed. We get this by doing e.key, and we can check if it's equal to enter. And if it's equal to enter, what we wanna do is call this.props.submit. And I wanna pass in the current value of text. So this is something I wanna pass down from app.js. So when I call this, I wanna say submit and give it a function called this.create to do. So up here, I'm gonna say create to do. And we know it's gonna have one value in here called text. So this is the function that we're passing to submit. And then our form, we're calling submit, passing in a string, which is text. So here is where we want to create to do. And we want to come over here to our playground and do create to do. And really there's only one value for this, which is the text. And then what stuff we want to get back. So the ID, the text, complete. And we want to get it all back in this case. And we'll see why in a second. I'm going to say const create to do mutation pass that in, and then we're gonna have one variable here. I'm gonna call it dollar sign text. And by the way, you do not have to call it the same name as what you have here, just a good convention that I like to follow. So text, string, and that's gonna be mandatory. Come down here, and actually all the way down, because we wanna add another one. So this is gonna be create to do mutation, and I'm gonna say create. So, in here now, I'm gonna say, and we can, I guess, copy this because we're gonna be doing similar things. I need to make this asynchronous. I'm gonna say create to do. The variables that I'm gonna pass in is just the text. And now I wanna update the store after we create the to do because I wanna update the to do query and add my new to do. But here I care about the second thing because the second thing here, data and then create to do. This is gonna have three values. It's gonna have the ID, the text, and complete, which is what we need. To. So I'm just going to push it on. So push, and we're gonna add this create. So we read what to do's we have cached. We add the new item that we added, and then we write it back to the query. So usually what I like to do is just add a console log statement to see if this is not getting called or what could possibly be going wrong. E.key, this might be an uppercase enter, not a lowercase. Yep, and that was the case. So uh, watch out for that. And you'll notice this did not clear. So two things I noticed. First off, this did not clear at the top. We wanna do that. And secondly, it added it at the very bottom. I wanna add it at the top. So we know this was getting called. And after we submit, we're just going to say this dot set state and set it to an empty string and that will clear it. And then our app.js, we're pushing to the end. There's a function called unshift. This adds it to the beginning. So if I say first, we now have an item at the beginning. And now I can just rapid fire create items if I want to. I can check them off, I can delete them if I want. And we have a whole to-do list uh, created. So that is it for this tutorial. We did all the operations, creating, reading, updating, and deleting to do items. I hope that was helpful and uh, you got a good grasp of how to do this and a little taste of how GraphQL and React works. If you have any questions, please leave a comment below. I'd be happy to answer. Again, thanks for watching, guys, and leave any questions you have in the comments below.